Good morning and welcome to this Monday, March 27th, 2023 edition of Trading Places Live at EarningsBeats.com. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes, featuring everything you need to know as you prepare for the trading day ahead. Well, we are heading into the last week of March, um, where typically, historically, we start to see some bullishness emerge. Uh, of course, there's no guarantees that happens this year, but um, historically, that's what we tend to see. Uh, we are opening the week uh, with some green futures. We've got the Dow futures up 223 points, S&P 500 futures up about 26, NASDAQ futures up about 37. Uh, crude oil uh, currently up a buck 45, getting close to $71 a barrel after dropping well into the 60s recently. U.S. 10-year Treasury yield, <clears throat> excuse me, up 12 basis points today, 3.50%. We were at 3.30%, actually just below that, 3.29 and change uh, at the beginning of the day on Friday. So we've come up quite a bit off of that. So there's a lot of volatility taking place, not just in the stock market, but also in the bond market as the 10-year uh, Treasury yield tries to forecast um, what the Fed may or may not do in the future. Um, and I know some of you probably look at that and say, well, that doesn't make any sense because the Fed is looking at the Fed funds rate, which is a short-term rate. That's what they impact. Why would the 10-year Treasury yield, which tends to track mortgages and so forth, why would that be giving us any short-term clues? Well, for me, <clears throat> what the Fed's worried about is inflation. That's what they keep talking about. That's why they're, they remain vigilant about raising rates. Well, the one thing you can see with long-term rates is whether or not investors are requiring additional yields to cover future inflation. And it's really hard to argue that folks buying the 10-year treasury are really concerned about inflation right now when they're willing to buy a 10-year treasury yield that yields 3.5%. I mean, inflation, you know, the, the one-year rate now, well, we got up to 6.5%. We're probably back down. I haven't even looked at it recently, but we're probably back down under 6. Um <clears throat> Why would you want a 3.5% yielding 10-year Treasury yield if you're worried about inflation at 6%? It makes no sense. You'd be selling 10-year Treasuries all day long at this rate, you know, 3.5%. And that, in turn, would drive the yields much higher as you sell off bonds. So the bond market is telling us that investors are willing to accept these lower yields. And so the bond market is telling the Fed, hey, we're not worried about inflation. And so every time the Fed decides, hey, we're going to raise rates, to me, that's putting unnecessary pressure on banks. And maybe that's their goal. You know, where we've got this financial crisis, bank crisis just kind of popped up here over the last month or so. That is one thing you have to be thinking about when the bond market is telling you one thing. And we see rates still at low or are still at levels that historically are very low. And you've got the Fed, on the other hand, can you know raising rates considerably. So that's one of the challenges, certainly, that the market is facing right now. And currently, a lot of that is contained in the financial area in the banks. Now, one bearish argument is that hey, this is going to spread. The banks are going to stop lending or they're going to curb their lending. That's going to impact the economy. We're going to have a recession. Everything else is going to follow suit to the downside. That's certainly an argument. I don't believe it's going to happen because I think the bond market, number one, is telling us the Fed's going to stop. So, yeah, we're inverted on the yield curve. I think that is definitely playing into some weakness in the banks. There's no doubt about it. I just don't think it's going to play out into the economy. I think that there are a lot of things that have happened over the last three years with the pandemic that quite honestly don't line up with the things that were normal, you know, we usually see in the market technically. And I think you've got to be careful about drawing comparisons here over the past three years to other times in history, because in other times in history, we haven't had a pandemic. It's been a hundred years since we've had anything like this. Of course, the financial markets are much different today. And I have said one thing that I will give the Fed some leeway on and I've said, I think it's a really difficult job, is that 
I don't know that there's a pandemic playbook out there that says, hey, when the pandemic hits and these things start happening, this is what you need to do. I think the Fed is, to some degree, you know, kind of flying by the seat of their pants. And I don't say that in a disrespectful way. I'm saying that I don't know that anybody else could have done it any differently. You know, we're kind of reacting to a lot of things that's happening. Anyhow, um, I do see, I do pay attention to the intermarket analysis, though, because there are a lot of folks out there plenty smarter than me. I mean, these big Wall Street firms, they've got their, you know, Harvard MBAs, uh, all these Ivy League schools, the best students out there. Um, you know, that's who they've brought in as their economists. I mean, they're brilliant people. And while I might not be able to stay up there with them on an, that kind of a level, I can look at the charts and see where the money's going. So in essence, I can kind of start to get the story of what Wall Street is saying and what all these MBAs are saying on Wall Street. And that's the critical part of technical analysis that, in my opinion, is ignored way too often. All we do is we look at the lines on the chart. Oh, we're, we're trending up. We're trending down. Well, that's good. But when you get to a point where you have big market reversals, those lines on the chart are lagging. And it takes a long time for them to beat you over the head with what you should have known several months prior. And that's what I try to do in all of my research. I try to go back and I try to figure out what could have given us an advantage before this top or this bottom. And I go back and apply that history and I try to come away with some key takeaways that I think are really important in, in evaluating the stock market so that you're just not going by what the line on the chart says. It's a combination. I'm not trying to downplay technical analysis because I think it's massive. It's huge. I mean, if you're going to ask me between a financial statement and a chart, I'm going to take the chart every time. Financial statements are old news. That, looking in the rearview mirror. It's all stuff that's already happened. The chart, the stock market looks ahead. So if you're looking at price action, you're starting to get a feel for what the market is expecting down the road. Completely different animals. Now, I think over time, the fundamentals play a big role. But trying to time your entry and exit into stocks based on an income statement? No, you can keep that. Anyhow, got off on a little tangent here this morning, but hey, it's Monday. Not a whole lot going on this week other than, of course, um, what the Fed had to say and all this inflation talk and higher interest rates or, you know, have they peaked, whatever. Um, but let's take a look at what happened last week. We got the Dow Jones Industrial Average on Friday, went up 132 points, S&P 500 up 22, NASDAQ up 36. The mid caps, actually, I haven't shared my screen, so let me do that. I uh, caught it just in the nick of time here. Okay, here we go. So there's your Dow Jones up 132, S&P up 22, NASDAQ up 36. Then we've got um, mid caps finished up 17, small caps up 12. So we went up across the board on a percentage basis. Small caps were your leader on Friday. NASDAQ actually laggered among the five. And... I don't know if you saw the leaderboard, sector leaderboard on Friday, but it was all defensive groups leading on Friday. Now, those of you who know me well <clears throat> know that that's a red flag. Anytime the market goes up and we're seeing leadership from defensive groups, that's generally not a good thing. However, one day doesn't make a trend. I mean, we've been talking about money rotating into growth for months. So to see one day's action moving into defense, not too concerning. If that's a pattern that continues as we go forward, let's say that you know we're looking at the Dow and the Dow starts to make this move up, S&P, we get a breakout on the NASDAQ. And if we see all that over, say, the next month, and, you've, and you're looking at the leadership of sectors over the last month, and you see those defensive names at the top, I'll be talking a lot more about that. That will not be a good sign. It's not the only signal, but that would certainly be one that would tell us to be much more cautious. So keep all that in mind. But here down at the bottom, you can see the sectors. Utilities rose 3% on Friday. Real estate, 2.5%. Consumer staples, one7 And healthcare, 1.39%. These are your four defensive groups. One, two, three, four. And they were the leaders on Friday. Hasn't happened much in 2023, but it did happen on Friday. It's worth mentioning. 
because if it continues, it would not be a good signal. So we want to, if we do see the market continuing to move up, let's watch to see if defensive lead. Now, what could happen, because we've seen so much strength in growth versus value, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a little bit of rotation back. I think part of that might have been happening last week. As I said, the Dow and the S&P both outperformed the NASDAQ. So that's certainly a possibility here in the short term, and that's fine. But if that's the case, what I would like to see leading would be financials and industrials, because they're more aggressive, but from a value perspective, more from a value perspective. But they're still, these are areas of the market that historically have at least performed as well as the S&P 500, if not above the S&P 500 when the market is going higher. So that's where I'd like to see if the leadership's going to rotate for a short period of time. Let's see financials and industrials get back up to the top. Otherwise, I'm going to be looking for technology, consumer discretionary, and communication services. 10-year treasury yield. Get the update here right now. We're sitting at 3.49%. So we have rallied. This was that low. On Friday, we moved to the lowest level we've seen since September on the 10-year treasury yield. You know, if inflation is persisting and potentially even strengthening, this yield should continue moving up. The fact that we took out this triple bottom, now we didn't exactly confirm it with a big uh, filled candle to the downside. Filled candle would mean that the yield's dropping all day. Hollow candle means we actually, after a gap down, the yield was moving up throughout the day, which means treasury prices were going down. So they were, you know, bond investors were selling on Friday, even though we did finish lower on the yield, we gap lower and you can see it better on like a, an intraday chart. So let me show you here. This was the gap down on Friday morning in the 10 year treasury yield. And you can see we closed up almost on the high of the day and then had the gap up today. So this definitely looks like a short-term reversal. But if we go back to that daily chart, I would watch the 20-day moving average, which right now is about 360, 361 actually, 3.612. But it's coming down steadily. Then you've got the recent high where we gapped up and then failed with that red filled candle. That high was at 364, the open 363.8. And then you got the 50, which is 366. That's the 50-day moving average. So I'm going to say this whole area right here is pretty critical in the short term. Long term, I mean, I think we're still consolidating. It looked like we were breaking down. You know, we've seen these false breakouts multiple times. I mean, here we went through the 20, went back up above this high, and it looked like we were moving back toward these highs. And then what happened? We went right back down again. Then it looked like on Friday, we were breaking these lows. And then what happens? We come right back up again. So to me, this is more sideways consolidation. We haven't yet gotten that, that move that where you don't have to try and overthink it. I'm looking for that move that says we are, we've broken down and the yield is, you know, the investors are just flocking into the 10-year treasury sending the yield down. That's what I'm looking for. Looked like we might have that start on Friday and then we re reversed back to the upside. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna take a big picture look at the market because still, I think the big question on everyone's mind is, have we bottomed? I've given you my opinion. I've told you, I said back when the S&P 500, uh, let's see, let's go over here. Let's just put in the S&P on a daily chart. So first time that I called bottom was back here, right on this bottom. And it looked like I hit it perfect. Market rebounded. Then, of course, we had the Jackson Hole speech by the Fed that completely changed everything, in my opinion. Went back down for another month or two and put in a second low. And I think it was right at about the end of September. I don't remember. Maybe the 26th, 27th, somewhere in here. I said, you're getting your second chance. I called bottom 2.0. I said, we're getting another bottom. But this one's not going to last either. And we ended up with that CPI report. I think it was the September CPI report that came out on October 13th. That was when we saw the gap down, high inflation, and everybody was buying. Look at the volumes pick up 
on that huge hollow candle. We haven't gone back down there again. So might have just missed the bottom. I was pretty close. The signals I use, I think, are pretty outstanding in terms of looking for reversals in the market. It's a combination of intermarket analysis, sentiment, um, sector performance. There's a lot of different things go into it. The price, it, price itself, you know, I look for divergences and so forth. Um, hold on one second. Okay, thanks. Um, so there are a lot of different things that go into calling bottoms or tops. I don't just randomly throw out bottoms and top calls. I think for those of you who listened to me for a long time, I don't say, I don't try to scare folks with calling tops every other week, like a lot of folks do. Uh, I mean, every time it, you know, you roll over, it's like, oh, that's it. We're back in the bear market. And then we start rallying again. Well, it looks like the bottom's in. Oh, never mind. We're going back down. I try not to do that. I try to get an overall, do I believe the stock market is bottoming and now in an uptrend? Because my trading strategies completely change. If I'm in a market where I believe prices go higher versus where if I'm in a market where I believe prices go lower. Hopefully that makes sense. I don't want the same strategies. If you've been trying to use the same strategies on the long side for the last year and three months that you used back in 20 and 2021, 2020, 2021, it's not worked. I mean, if you were buying growth stocks on pullbacks in 2022, you got crushed. You didn't want to be in growth stocks. They might've bounced for a couple of days, maybe around option expiration. Other than that, they were getting clobbered. So you can't approach an uptrending market and a downtrending market in the same fashion and with the same strategies. They don't work. So it's important for me to get a sense of, do I believe the market's going up or do I believe the market's going down? Because my strategy is going to be much different. Here on the S&P 500, when we bottom and it looks like, hey, this is the bottom, then I'm going to start. The first thing I want to do is just be long. I want to be long, usually the ETFs. I don't trust individual stocks because we haven't really, even till now, we haven't been in an uptrend long enough to show where the leadership is truly coming from. I mean, I, I could say, okay, semiconductors are certainly uh, leading to the upside. That would be one area that I'd be comfortable trading on pullbacks, but there aren't many others. It's just been back and forth, volatility, rotation. It's been really difficult, but the overall bottoms have held. And I believe we're getting ready to rally into the next, I, I think probably for the next six, seven weeks, I think we're going to have a pretty good size rally. It's just my opinion based on the bullish signals I'm seeing underneath the surface and based on history, knowing when the stock market moves. I mean, I said when we got into the middle part of February that the balance of February and March were going to be a struggle. That was likely to be the period where if we were going to go back down, that was the period. And that's what we've done. The S&P 500 has been trending down. And that wasn't any brilliant call. It's simply, if you just look at history, the stock market does much better when it is anticipating earnings and through the earnings season. And then once you start to wind down many of the first and second tier companies, and most of those earnings reports are in your rear view mirror, at that point, you start to see the market tend to struggle. Doesn't necessarily have to be a sell-off, but it could just be sideways consolidation. You know, all of a sudden you go from uptrend to not really doing much and it gets frustrating. And that's what we've been doing here. But the good news is we're about a few days away. I'm going to say Wednesday. Wednesday is about historically when things start to pick back up again for the next earnings run. Now, does it happen every quarter? No, it does not. If you believe the earnings are going to be horrible, hey, maybe we get the sell-off. Maybe this bear market really kicks into gear. Maybe you're right. I don't have a crystal ball. I just tell you what I think based on all my signals. And I think we're going higher. I said when we were pulling back here, I thought 37.75, maybe a stretch would be this gap support around 37.50. That's what I thought. 
to the downside. We got down to almost 3,800. Pretty close. And I wouldn't be surprised if this right here is the start of the uptrend. We got the Fed in the rear view mirror. I thought the Fed was actually pretty good other than the 25 basis point hike, but the market was expecting that. Most everyone was looking for that. I was holding out hope that they wouldn't do it. I think all they're doing is putting more pressure on the banking system, which is absolutely stupid, in my opinion. But hey, you know, you got a bond market saying inflation, we're not worried about it. And you got the Fed saying, well, we're just, just in case. Let's just do another 25. Meanwhile, banks are struggling. And all that's doing is raising the cost of funds for banks. It really is dumb. I mean, I'm sorry to be that ruthless, but I, I just don't think it's a smart move. Hey, they're a, I will say everybody on that Federal Reserve, uh, the Open Market Committee, hey, they're all much smarter than me. I just don't think they're paying attention. Maybe they don't do a whole lot of intermarket analysis. I don't know. They pay attention to the economic reports. Hey, I know what the 1970s were, was like. I, you know, I was a kid growing up in the 70s, but I remember some of the things that were going on back in the 70s, especially into the early 80s. Nobody wants that ever again. But the bond market's telling us we're not going, that's not where we're heading. So anyway, I think the Fed needs to tap on the brakes. I think we need to pause for a little bit. And then when they realize that inflation keeps coming down, there's no reason not to cut. And I think that's still coming later this year. Anyway, here's the S&P 500 on the daily chart. But I want to show you long term. I want to show you what would bother me. And things I've talked about over the course of the last 15 months to look for to confirm a secular bear market. I have said since the beginning of January of last year, before it ever even began, I started talking about a cyclical bear market. Cyclical. That's short-term in nature. It can be as short as a month, like we saw with the pandemic in March of 2020, or it can go over a year, but I'm going to say three to six months is typical maybe even as far out as maybe nine months. And that's what we got. I mean, if we go out, we'll just do a year and six months here. I mean, from top to bottom, January to October, that's into, I mean, January, beginning of January into September, that's nine months. So October, you're into your 10th month. And I've said this many times recently, but I'll say it one more time for those of you who are new. This bottom, if this turns out to be the ultimate bottom, this will be the seventh time in the last 14 bear markets that the low was found in the month of October. Seven out of 14. That seems like more than a coincidence. There are 12 different months. If there have been 14 different bear markets, you'd think they'd just be scattered everywhere. Half of them have been in October. They bottomed in October. That's one of the reasons why October gets such a bad name is because usually that's the... the the peak of the bear market before we finally start to rally. Anyhow, we're not going to confirm a breakout until we get through 4,200 and especially on the longer term chart, 4,300. I'll show you a weekly chart in just a minute. Um, let's talk about the long-term monthly chart. This is a hundred years. I think this qualifies as long-term. And in fact, the last pandemic was right back in here somewhere to give you an idea visually of how long it's been since we've had anything like this. 1918 was the pandemic. And I think it was the year of or the year after the Dow went up 30% with the pandemic. That was one of the reasons why I said back in March, 2020, that it was a healthcare crisis, not a financial crisis. And market came roaring right back. But anyway, when you look at this long-term chart, couple of things stand out to me when we talk about secular bear markets. We don't get confirmation until we see the P monthly PPO go negative. So this was 2000, actually it was 2001, where we finally went negative. So we had this move down, tried to rally back through the moving averages, never could get through the moving averages. And then we rolled back over again. And the worst of the bear market occurred 
after the PP, monthly PPO went negative. Look at 2008. Of course, 2007, we had another top in this secular bear market that lasted about 13 years, 12, 13 years. Um, we had another top. And if you notice, the big selling took place after the monthly PPO went negative again. The big drops in the fourth quarter, the PPO had gone negative. Go back to the 1970s when we started the bear market, early 70s, PP, monthly PPO negative. 75, 74 into 75, right here. PPO, monthly PPO negative. The point here is that in order to have a secular long-term bear market, you have to have weakness long enough for the monthly PPO to go negative. If you look at where we are right now, and we've seen this before, by the way, the 1987 crash, then we rebound. And then we had the 1990 um, Persian Gulf War with a recession. That all occurred with this PPO pointing straight down, getting close to the zero line, but not quite making it, and then turning around and going up. The 1960s, 50s and 60s, it looked like here, back in 1953, pulling back, PPO started to look pretty weak. And then we moved back up and get turned and rolled over and started going higher again. Next leg of the bull market. Then we had these different pullbacks. And we actually had a couple of these that looked to me like we may have hit the center line or just below it. But then we turned right back up and came back up above. But you can see during these long-term secular bull markets, the PPO stays pretty much above the zero line. The RSI, monthly RSI, stays mostly above 40. During secular bears, monthly PPO goes negative and stays there for a while. And you can see that the RSI, look at the monthly RSI, going down to 30 over here, going down to in the teens here below 30, into the teens. These all occurred in secular bear markets. Look at where we are right now. Monthly PPO getting close to that center line looks to me like it's starting to roll back up. Price action staying above the 50 month. That was important. You can see back at the beginning of this bear, we went below the 50, came back up, failed, and then kept going down. We've still got a lot of work. Now, if we go back down and take out the October low, it's going to be really hard to say that it's not secular because at that point, we're going to be a year into it. Well, a year and a half into it, probably, depending on when we would, would go back down. But starting in January 2022, we, we would already be 15 months into it and then some if we break back down again. That monthly PPO would go negative at that point. The monthly RSI pretty good chance that it's going to go down below 40, probably start heading toward 30. That would all start to line up more with what we see in a secular bear market. What we tend to see in a cyclical bear market within a secular bull market is the PPO monthly coming down to the zero line, RSI coming down into the 40s, which is exactly what we're doing right now. Now, we don't know what's going to happen. Maybe we're going to just keep going, right? I mean, we've seen during other periods where we've had the PPO above, we just go right through that center line. Maybe that's going to happen here. But a lot of my other signals are not saying that's going to happen. And that's why I don't think it's going to happen. <clears throat> first of all, let's look at the weekly chart on the S&P 500. Low or low? First of all, low. PPO goes negative, pointing straight down. We rally. PPO does not get above the center line. And then we price action goes right back down to new lows. And what does the PPO do? Goes right back down to new, new lows. Momentum is accelerating to the downside. Then we have this pop back over the summer. We go back down to one more low. And on that low, we actually have a slightly higher PPO. So it's telling us momentum is not quite as strong to the downside. Now, one caveat here, I would say, though, is that we hit the 50 period uh, moving average, which to me kind of negates this prior P 
PPO. So I'm kind of on the fence as to whether or not that's truly a negative divergence by definition, or excuse me, positive divergence. By definition, it is. But I'm just not sure that, I mean, it, it looks like it maybe it's too far apart to really count on that. But we've gone back up through the 20, got to the 50, put in a higher low, and then went back up and put in a higher high. And we're still holding this higher low. So I would say at a minimum, the S&P 500 is neutral. I don't think this is bearish at all. We got the PPO went above the center line. Now it's come back down to test the center line. I mean, until it's proven otherwise, to me, this looks like the, an uptrend. Break below that 3750 level on the weekly chart would start to paint a more bearish picture, which is why on the daily chart, I think that level is important as well. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk, I know it's 930, so the market just opened. One, one last thing I wanted to talk about was the internet group. I wrote an article over the weekend and I did an earnings beats digest uh, newsletter article this morning on the internet group because I think three of the key industry groups to watch in looking for an emerging bull market advance is the semiconductors, the software, and the internet group. Semiconductors are clearly in an uptrend. Software recently broke out, but just by a little. So it's starting to look more bullish for software. And then you've got um, internet stocks, which have not yet make, made the breakout, but they're right on the cusp. Now, a couple of things that I'm watching if you've noticed, the AD line tends to fail right about where we are. So if we can get a push through 2,500 and get that AD line breaking to a new high, I think that would confirm the third of the three amigos, in my opinion, on the, this market going higher. These three groups should not be breaking out above those February highs if we're truly in a secular bear market. It just shouldn't happen. So that's one thing I'm watching. And if you look at the weekly chart on the, um, net, uh, on the internet stocks, this is internet relative to the S&P 500. And look at what was happening at the uh, right at the beginning of 2022 when the market was at a high. Notice that for the last five, oh, well, four months, three and a half months of the year, internet stocks were underperforming. Money was rotating out of one of the key groups as the market reached the top. And now here we are going down and look at what has transpired over the last four or five months. Look at this relative strength. So even though the, we haven't seen a breakout on the absolute price chart, we have seen a breakout on the relative price chart. Money is rotating into internet stocks. And down here at the bottom is a correlation coefficient of the direction of the relative performance of internet stocks versus the direction of the S&P 500. And if you notice, all of these readings above 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 are telling us that the direction of the relative strength of internet stocks tends to go with the direction of the S&P 500 more often than not. Now, there are times, and over the last, this is when we went into the secular bull market, in my opinion, 2013. So we've had a few occasions where we've gone down to minus 0.5 or, or lower. But we've had many more occasions when we are above that 0.5. So, and it's not perfect correlation. I'm not trying to say that. There's definitely some back and forth. But the fact that this group is now breaking out again on a relative basis is just another good signal for the market. Let's take a look at what's going on to open up, see if the market opened in positive territory. Uh, yeah, Dow up 290, and you can see that rotation back to the Dow and the S&P. I can just look at the opening, you know, and that's been completely different for probably the last couple of weeks, maybe a few weeks, and really throughout the year, since the beginning of the year. So it could be that we're starting to see a little bit more bullish rotation back toward the down the S&P, which wouldn't be bad. But when we see that, we want to see financials and industrials. So the last thing I'll do is just pull that sector summary up. Let's see what's leading today. There's your financials. There's your industrials. So we are seeing that 
rotate back. And I mentioned in the weekly, por uh, weekly portfolio report yesterday to members to watch the financials. I really think that they are going to rebound this week. I wouldn't be surprised to see them have a solid week. Growth stocks, I think, will do okay. I think everything goes higher this week, just my opinion. But I wouldn't be surprised at value just because it's been lagging so badly of late. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe that leads uh, more to the upside. All right, that is it for me. Listen, everybody have a great day. I'll be back tomorrow over at Stock Charts TV at 9 a.m. for your next recorded version of Trading Places Live. So make sure you check that out. Just simply go over, click on that at 9 a.m. and you listen into the show. Um, you can also go to Earnings Beats. And if you'd like to sign up for our free newsletter, just scroll down, name and email address is all you need. You can unsubscribe at any time, no credit card required. If you want to check out our service, and I think the next month or two is going to be critical, I think it'll be a great time to use a 30-day free trial, especially if I'm right about this market rolling to the upside. Uh, again, 30-day free trial. You do have to give credit card with this one, but we will remind you before your 30 days expires to see if you want to re-up. Anyhow, have a great day, everybody. See you tomorrow over at Stock Charts. Happy trading.